much. Hello. <laughs> Not the highlight of the afternoon, just get that clear. Um, uh, I am the post-lunch comedy relief slash warm-up. Um, if I could have my slides up, that would be great. Um, octopi. Blank screen. <laughs> Spiders. Hawks. Puppies. Just let the puppies wash over you for a moment. Lull you into a false sense of security. Um, centaurs. Um, and I work at Google, which makes things like this. Um, virtual assistants. Um, everybody's got one. Um, hi. I'm Matt Jones. I'm a designer. I work at Google. I work in Google Research, Google AI. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the stuff that we've been doing. But I'm also going to kind of talk to you a little bit about stuff that I, I usually would, well, I sort of would like to wear a t-shirt most of the time saying, my views do not necessarily represent those of my employers. Um, I should be wearing that right now. Um, but some of the work that we have been doing, you may have seen this um, product that came out um, last autumn. This is Google Clips. Um, this is a little tiny camera about this big. Ah, hang on. Physical prop, always useful. It's about this big, because it is this big, one to one. Um, this is an AI. It's a robot photographer. It has a little tiny mind inside it that looks at things that are interesting to its owner in the world and takes a photograph, um, which means that you don't need to viewfind it. It means it's marketed um, at parents and at people who um, would like to be out from behind the, the smartphone, if you like, and in the world with the people that they love. And you can sort of see the output that you get from a robotic photographer acting as your co-pilot uh, on the right there. Uh, that's Justin, who is the product manager. Um, one other thing that I've been, I worked on was, is now in the Pixel 2 phone. Um, it's a feature called Now Playing, which um, employs an on-device neural network to detect uh, if there's music playing around you and then detect what the song is from a, a, a library of about 72,000 songs. Um, it does all of this on device without any need for a network, without any need to ping a sort of centralized brain. Um, and talking of centralized brains, that's kind of what I want to talk about is kind of a different attitude to what we're designing and building. Um, and also, I just like to give this talk in order to show this GIF, because uh, it's one of my favorite GIFs on the internet. Um, and what you can see here is, is what, we're kind of, what we're sort of designing for, which are the neurons which are not in that kind of central processing unit, not in the brain, but the, things that, the neurons that you have in your knee or in your stomach or in your spinal cord. Um, we have neurons everywhere. We have thinking all over us. And there are other things um, in the world that are like that we, we use as inspiration. Um, another bit of inspiration, um, some of you might know who this is, Kevin Kelly. Um, editor at large at Wired and author of What Technology Wants and The Inevitable. Um, two very interesting books, two very Californian books in their outlook. Um, the title, The Inevitable, is the clue there, perhaps. Um, but he does have this kind of interesting um, uh, parallel, uh, sort of analogy that he has for um, the march of AI into our world uh, to look back at the parallels to the march of electrification at the turn of the last century. Um, and sort of see what can play out in terms of what we design and what we don't anticipate um, from what happened in the past. And of course, we have, uh, if, you, you know, if, you, if you extend that analogy, we sort of have the big power stations of, of, of cognification that um, are built around the place. Um, uh, my colleagues from Google Cloud will talk to you a lot about the ability to use those sorts of things for the things you want to achieve. Um, but the sorts of things that I work on are with um, Google's hardware PA, um, looking at those kind of neurons that we can embed in devices, on-device intelligence, on-device AI. Uh, for instance, being able to put um, the ability to translate and, uh, well, to recognize and uh, pattern match language in lens, in the camera, um, uh, as you can sort of see from uh, our examples with Google Translate. Um, yeah, I told you I really like showing this gift, didn't I? Um, 
So that, that, looking back at that, kind of, that, that analogy of electrification, I think the moment that the kind of on-device um, you know, tiny neurons uh, pattern um, uh, uh, sort of resembles is when the fractional horsepower electric motor was, was available and became truly cheap. And that was, for, I think, the change that happens when things become small and cheap is often the one that we, we sort of overlook the most. And that's kind of where we're getting to right now. And you will have heard a lot of people talking about um, this on the cutting edge stage already. Um, uh, so I don't really need to um, go out on a limb about this prediction, I don't think. But the idea that the uh, kind of small edge AIs will get closer to us and our environment, become embedded in our environment, become more coordinated as a network, as a mesh, rather than a sort of, uh, a, a sort of um, hub and spoke topology, um, and as a result get more self-sufficient, is incredibly interesting in terms of the potential it has for designing new products, new services, new devices, which is what I'm involved in day to day. And I would commend to you um, uh, Pete Warden's blog about this um, that he published this week um, ahead of his talk, which I think was yesterday, Azim. Um, uh, Pete's talk, a uh, really excellent blog post looking at kind of these very small embedded, um, not even in some ways brains, you know, kind of like little um, Im embedded uh, cognate entities in the world and how we might design for that. Um, and as I say, these things becoming closer to us, becoming prosthetics rather than others um, is, is what I'm kind of interested in. And, and, and with that, I wanted to take you on a very small detail, detour into the hell that is being a designer in technology sometimes when a film comes out that then everybody talks to you about for the next 10 years or so. Um, so designers labored under the yoke of Minority Report for, for about a decade or so. You know, clients coming in and going, can you make it a bit like that? You know, we've seen this thing. And, and so I think that kind of the, the impact and the gravity that culture, uh, cultural products have on the trajectory of, of, of our technologies is a, is a very important thing for us all to bear in mind and question. Um, you know, and right now, this is what's happening, right? So people are, can you make it a little bit like, well, not perhaps not like, you know, ex machina, perhaps that would be the wrong way to go. But can you, you know, can you make it like Scarlett Johansson? Can you, you know, can we give it? It's like, well, that's a bit weird. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a very deep-seated old uh, cultural reference that we have from Pygmalion onwards. We wanted to create this kind of magical, generally female, which is a bit odd and needs a lot of examination by a lot of people, um, kind of fake human. Um, it's, it, but it's, you know, my attitude to this, I would like to say, is like a very sort of high-minded kind of, um, you know, uh, underpinned by the social sciences and engineering and all the rest of it. Um, but it's just because I'm lazy. This is really hard. This is so hard. It's so hard to make fake humans. And we can make so many other things that are useful. Um, that, that's kind of, um, kind of what I'm very interested in. Um, and Benedict Evans, if you, know, if you don't want to believe me as a sort of hippie socialist European, you can... Uh, uh, believe somebody who lives in California and has renounced all of those things, Benedict Evans. Um, you know, he, he makes this point that you know, we may be able to make general AI, and, and Kevin Kelly also makes this point in, in his, on his blog where he talks about alien intelligences being around us, but, but kind of like, it doesn't mean that it has to model human intelligence, and perhaps in fact it shouldn't. Um, which brings us back to my friends from the animal kingdom that I've begun with. Um, this just came out in, in paperback this week, Peter Godfrey, uh, Peter Godfrey Smith's book, Other Minds. Who here has read this? Terrific. It's, it's a fantastic, fantastic book. Real pleasure to read. Um, but his point is, you know, um, different animals are good at different things. Um, you know, you, you should read the whole book, but, you know, that's basically the thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, they, and, and, and that makes sense uh, given the environments they're in and the, the, you know, the objective functions that they sort of are performing to. And, and the thing that fascinates me about thinking about these other forms of mind that have co-evolved with us on the planet is, a, uh, and, and going back to the, uh, the speaker who gave a great talk uh, this morning on um, being inspired by biology, I think Animal Dynamics was a company, I forget the, 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 the gentleman's name. But thinking about being inspired by different forms of intelligence than the one that our cultural products ram down our throats is really, really useful and inspiring to me. Um, and at this point, I'll just let you look at some puppies again. Um, but the reason I mention puppies is, and, 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 and dogs is, is sort of thinking about this as, as non-human companion species. 
Um, there's been a lot written about companion species relationships um, and, and, and thinking about kind of almost, almost like the, the, the notion of the working animals that we've, we've sort of co-evolved with to sort of extend ourselves and work with rather than replacing us is something that I'm very inspired by and interested in. And a, 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 a source of, of cultural inspiration that I return to are the books of Philip Pullman, um, the His Dark Materials uh, trilogy. Again, show of hands who's read that, okay. Again, um, thinking in that about kind of this idea of the demon, um, in, if you haven't read the Philip Pullman books, every human being in that universe, in that fantasy universe, is comprised of two physical beings. Every individual is comprised of two physical beings, a human-like uh, uh, being and their demon, their spirit animal, their familiar. Um, but it's still them. It's their inner dialogue. It, but it has a, an extended sensorium, has abilities and intuitions that you don't have access to. It's me, but not me. And I think that's one of the things that I'm trying to kind of look at in my research is what do we get from l creating a relationship to learn systems to AI, to machine intelligences that are still me, but an extension of me, me, but not me, rather than an othered assistant that I have a dialogue with. What, what are the other sorts of relationship that we can have with, with these entities? I'm going back to, again, to the era of Pygmalion and, and, and sort of uh, uh, classical Greece, uh, the eudaimon. Um, uh, that Socrates has a counsellor whispered advice and opinions in your ear. Um, a person escorted by a you demon was considered fortunate. It was said during Socrates' lifetime that he had a demon that always warned him of threats and bad judgment, but never directed his actions. Uh, and as I say, this kind of notion of the companion species is something that's been written about for decades, particularly by Donna Haraway, who also wrote, wrote the Cyborg Manifesto, and her uh, a companion species manifesto, I commend to you as a short read, to kind of have a different um, uh, view on what we might design going forward in the next decade. Um, another book, this is just kind of like a reading list for everybody, um, in, in this realm is uh, not directly about machine intelligence, or but it is about companion species, is Hatches for Hawk by Helen MacDonald, which is a very moving memoir of her relationship training a, a bird of prey um, after the death of a family member. And she writes very beautifully about seeing the world, imagining the world through the eyes of her companion species. And this is kind of the thing that I'm kind of interested in. This is in this last um, paragraph, what is she seeing, I wonder? My brain does backflips trying to imagine it because I can't. And I think that's the realm of design, is to actually kind of create that bridge between these non-human intelligences, not try to make them legible as human necessarily, but try and make that bridge to, between the human and its companion species to extend the human. Um, and, and finally, I just want to talk about um, some uh, uh, work that's been going on around studying spiders, which I find fascinating in this realm, which is um, that spiders... Um, offload their cognition to their webs. Um, it, and the last part of this article in Quanta says, it is conceivable for cognition to be a property of a system with integrated non-biological uh, components. That seems to be where we're headed. Um, and the work of uh, Dr. Andy Clark in Edinburgh, um, whose book um, Surfing Uncertainty also extends extended um, apparatus of cognition is something which is very, very interesting in terms of kind of examining the ways that we create interfaces between companion species that may be non-biological and ourselves. Which brings me to the last mythical animal, um, centaurs. Um, and you may know um, uh, the work of, uh, of the, the writing, the book that um, uh, Gary Kasparov brought out, I think last year, where he was talking very much about his relationship to um, the um, systems that he, the chess playing systems that he 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 competed against in the 1990s and and his and his and how it's informed his thoughts about thinking and how it's in, informed his thoughts about AI. Um, and after being beaten by Deep Blue, he went and um, reacted to that by creating a um, a form of chess. Um, uh, which has been called various things, but the, 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 the term that I, I, I want to is uh, centaur chess, where there are teams of, of AIs and humans playing against other teams of AIs and humans. 
And, and that kind of extension of the human and design um, of, of those kinds of um, systems between kind of a human and a companion species, if you like, but doesn't think in the same ways, has a completely different sensorium, has advantages that the human cannot have, but also has, um, we heard this morning again about kind of Morovich's uh, paradox, has kind of the, uh, doesn't have the intuition or the ability to sort of uh, think synthetically in the ways that human has is, is something that we're kind of working very hard on doing. And one very small example of that, which is, is rolling out right now in Gmail, um, very different to chess, is um, uh, Smart Compose. And this is kind of the evolution of, of autocomplete, if you like, um, or Smart Reply, where there is a, a, a companion system helping you uh, write email. Um, it's, it's, it, and it's you, but not you. Right? It's, it's still, still your agency, you're still in control of it, but it's an augmentation, a compression of, of, of the work that you would normally be doing, sort of reflecting your memory, your kind of past lived experience that it can, it, it can store, and also kind of uh, patterns that it can, um, it, it can glean um, in privacy preserving ways from the mass of people who write emails around the planet to kind of help you um, write emails. And so this, kind of, this is kind of like, in, in sort of a very uh, non-fantastic way, me, but not me. Um, it's still me writing, but in an augmented and assisted way. And I think this is the kind of, this is the world that we're wandering into. Um, and it's the world that if you saw Sarah Gull's presentation this morning, that we have to be very careful at, at, as we define and design products around, um, as we make the U-Demon. Um, and that's where I wanted to leave you this afternoon. Thanks for your time.